QSO Today, episode 402, Jeffrey Mark, KM6TVJ. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign 4Z1UG, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. Jeffrey Mark, KM6TVJ, is one of the new kids on the block, a recent new amateur radio licensee, and he was a presenter at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo last March. Jeffrey has some fresh ideas, and our QSO around his career in the entertainment industry, a pilot and a maker, caused me to think of some non-traditional ways that we hams can communicate. KM6TVJ is my QSO today. KM6TVJ, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Jeffrey? 4Z1UG, you are 5 by 9 Thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, I was always interested in science fiction and science and electronics, although to be fair, I was better at taking things apart than putting them together as a kid. That did not go very far into adulthood, to be sure. Although I did have some fun, uh, one Hanukkah I was giving a, a 101 electronics kit, and I managed to turn it into an FM transmitter, which I then, uh, not knowing FCC rules, used to break into my mom's opera that she was listening to and ask for a sandwich. That was probably the beginning. <laughs> but I think you could do that because I think I had that kit as well, and I think that you were like under the milliwatt level. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so let me help you start at the beginning. What was the hometown? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. And you were a speaker at the last QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. And at that time, you had made some comments about electronic shops and shop classes not being available in the schools that you were in. That might put you in a certain time frame. What year were you born? I was born 1967. Oh, that's interesting. Then that means that probably the shop classes that I enjoyed in the 60s and 70s, those were probably gone by the time the 80s rolled around. Well, they were certainly gone. And it might also have been a Chicago thing. Uh, there was, I don't even remember a shop teacher. It was pretty basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. And were you in the public school? Yes, I was in public school uh, up until high school. Yeah. Okay, so we have a setting. Your hometown is Chicago. You have an interest in science and science fiction. You like to take things apart. Yep. It sounded to me like you didn't necessarily always put it back together. <laughs> no. Well, like I said, I didn't really know what I was playing with, although I you know, made the occasional buzzer or flashing light or something like that. But uh, no, it was, it was much more about uh, investigating what all the parts were. Now, being born in 1967, that would kind of put you as a teenager into the beginning of the computer age. Oh, that's correct. I did play with computers uh, from a very early age. I think I was uh, 11 or 12, uh, thereabouts, uh, when my mom got me a uh, TI-449A, 49, the Texas Instruments, the flat one. And that was a lot of fun to, uh, to program uh, and I, I taught myself basic on that. And then when I got into high school, uh, they had a PDP-11 uh, that I learned uh, was it Emacs and uh, more basic and some Pascal and uh, generally had a lot of fun with that. Right. And the PDP-11s, as I recall, if you're talking high school, I'm doing the math in my brain here to make sure I'm you know, in the right place. You were either working on the PDP-11 using like an ADM terminal which was like a dumb terminal, or you were using a computer teletype? They actually had uh, three or four of both. Ah, okay. So it all depended on who, who got there first. Obviously, the, uh, the terminals were more desired, but the teletype was, was just fine. And then I think Tektronix in those days also made a terminal that would actually hold images on the screen. They were burning phosphorus off of the screen like an Etch-a-Sketch in order to hold a display. That was a graphics terminal in those days. No, everything was text. And just would write uh, various text programs, uh, random poetry, and uh, things like that. Now, did you stay in Chicago throughout your 
growing up years, your high school years? Uh, yeah, I graduated uh, high school and then came out to Southern California. I went to USC, University of Southern California, majored in classical music composition with a minor in computer science. Whoa, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it was it was different. Classical music composition, as I recall, at USC, Christopher Parkning was a classical guitar performer as well as a teacher there at USC. Sounds familiar. Sure. Did you play an instrument? I played piano myself and a little guitar, although it was interesting. As composers, we didn't walk around the school with instruments slung to our back. So we would ha have a little contest amongst ourselves. We would uh, find a friendly performer of, a, you know, a flautist or a violinist or a oboe player and ask, hey, can you put that together and see how many of us can play it? And so we would grab whatever instrument that was and whoever could play a scale and a tune, every, all the other composers had to buy them lunch. And I never paid for lunch. It seems to me that the very cream at the top of the classical music graduates are the ones that might be writing music for television, for movies, for their own stuff. What did you end up doing? Well, uh, they didn't have the film composing degree when I was there. That started after I graduated. Uh, however, I did write a lot of uh, scores for a lot of the student films. Shortly after I graduated from college, in fact, that summer, uh, I started working in cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons, as a production assistant, bottom of the totem pole, uh, driving around Los Angeles, delivering scripts, delivering film, negative, whatever was needed. And that started my career in entertainment. And can you elaborate a little bit more on what a production assistant does? I mean, I think that we see the credits on a television or movie and it says producer. Right. I always got the impression that the producer is like the COO of a production. But maybe you, you can actually go into some more detail. As a production assistant, what did that mean? And if you became a producer, what does that mean? Well, a production assistant is, we used to call them the gopher. They would go for this and go for that. They're the bottom of the totem pole. Almost anybody in the organization could say, hey, Jeff, go drive across town and pick up a script or pick up a coffee uh, or grab donuts. Uh, they, I would also, you know, collate papers, I, you know, whatever, you know, little office stuff, uh, literally everybody's assistant. Now a producer, there's lots of different kinds of producers. So that's one reason why people outside the industry get confused. There are the creative producers who find a script, find a director, find the money, put together the whole project. There are line producers who, once all that is done, calculate how much things are going to cost, what the schedule is going to be, so on and so forth. There's associate producers. They could be the company lawyer, sometimes gets an associate producer credit. Then there's the executive producers who are usually the people who write a check, although sometimes they're the people who actually put a high-level deal, high deal together. So a famous actor's agent might get an executive producer credit for bringing that famous actor to the project. I've been a creative producer from time to time. I've done line producing. I've never been an executive producer, though. Any of us that grew up with Saturday morning cartoons, which was at least when I was in the 60s and 70s, that was the highlight of the week. But I do recall when I used to commute in Los Angeles passing Hanna-Barbera, many of the Saturday morning cartoons were made there. What company did you work for as a production assistant? I worked for several. Uh, the first one was uh, what they call a one-off. It was just started to produce one cartoon, and they produced Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates. And um, that's where I really sort of learned the ropes. And then that company would dissolve at the end of the production, but it was owned by Fox. After that, I went to a company called Fred Wolf Films, uh, which made Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, and James Bond Jr. and uh, The New Adventures of Speed Racer. Uh, after that, I went, to, well, actually, by while I was at Fred Wolf Films, I got promoted to production manager uh, and post-production supervisor. So those are jobs that are just a little bit above, even though the titles sound glorious, uh, mostly dealing with once the film has been animated, usually in Korea, I would take the film and the 
audio track and work with the composer, work with the colorist, basically get the film to broadcast. After uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I went to Film Roman, where I worked on The Simpsons. And that was pretty much the end of my animation career, because then I went into computer graphics after that. So this is very interesting, because you have this degree in classical music. You end up being this Saturday morning cartoon gopher as a production assistant. Right. I'm apologizing to the listeners, as I usually do, because I'm heading off on a tangent. But this tangent seems kind of interesting from the standpoint of not really having any background in this. Sure. Is it your experience that people who are behind the camera in these types of productions, that they really work their way up from the very bottom and acquire, it sounds to me like you're acquiring skills along the way, and it may be luck and happenstance that you actually take the fork that you end up taking. I, yeah, I would generally agree. Obviously, you hear about uh, people who might be the son of or the daughter of somebody famous or of a uh, you know, big-time producer, and they might have a leg up. But in reality, the entertainment business is incredibly complicated. There are so many moving parts at every level. And this isn't to say that everybody's a genius. It's just a very complex process. So in order to be competent at a given level, you have to learn the ins and outs. I never went to film school, so I don't know what the curriculum is there. However, I can't imagine how they could teach all the many details that go into even one as you say, fork <laughs> of, uh, of entertainment. I went into post-production uh, because I enjoyed the pace a little better. When you're on set, the pace is uh, incredibly fast, and I enjoy that from time to time. And the hours are incredibly long. A 16-hour day is usually, well, 12-hour days are the minimum, and 16-hour days are pretty standard. Um, and I've done that from time to time, but that's not my preferred place. I like having more, more time to get the job done right. So you give us an appreciation that if we stay, I'm one of these people that when I go to a movie, I stay until the Academy leader comes up at the end. And I do that because I think it's important to kind of recognize all of the people that are part of a production and also to see if there's anybody there that I might have known growing up. And uh, occasionally I'm satisfied with seeing a name of someone that I knew growing up in Southern California who ended up in the movie business. But it takes hundreds of people to put a movie together. Agreed. And even the ending credits might have a dozen or more people. Oh, yes. Yes. I've, I've made end credits. They're challenging, uh, very exacting, possibly one of the most exacting parts of filmmaking because there are so many contracts involved in whose name goes where, how big, what the font size is, how fast it can go by. Certain people in their contract say that their name has to be on the screen for a certain number of seconds. So, yes, uh, the people who make the end crawl are absolutely vital to the industry, as everybody in the industry is. One thing that I love about entertainment, it is so challenging and so difficult and also so rewarding to the right kind of person, right kind of personality, that if you stick around for more than five or six years, you love it. You can't not love it. You find something else to do. So everybody who's been there for a while is doing what they love. And that is uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful way to go to work when you're surrounded by people like that. And now this message from ICOM America. Field Day is coming on June 26th and 27th, and since it is Ham Radio's most popular event, you can be a Field Day leader with ICOM. Connect with nature, connect with friends. You will easily cut through the pileups with a powerful and high-quality ICOM base station, the popular ICOM IC705 Portable, the ICOM IC7300, and the ICOM IC7610 SDR transceivers are the clear choice for contesters and DXers across the globe. The ICOM IC705 is the perfect transceiver for hams who enjoy both the indoors and the great outdoors on field day. It is the perfect contesting companion because this base station provides features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters and it weighs in at just under 2 pounds. Features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall display, 5 watts with the BP272 battery pack, and 10 watts with a 13.8-volt DC power source. 
single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functionality, micro USB connector, Bluetooth, wireless LAN, and micro SD card slot are all standard equipment, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger and the HM243 speaker microphone is standard equipment. The ICOM IC705 has new accessories now available. The MBF705 desktop stand for just the right viewing angle on your desk and the AH705 optional automatic antenna tuner that covers 1.8 MHz to 50 MHz bands with a 30 meter or 100 foot or longer wire antenna. The ICOM IC7300 is a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. This radio changed the way that entry-level HF transceivers are designed. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen display, real-time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. I have the ICOM IC7300, and it is by far the best HF transceiver that I have ever owned. It is always listening to 20 meter CW while I work. The ICOM IC7610 is the SDR transceiver that every ham wants. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out faint signals in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that has changed the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. Features include, but are not limited to, RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, you can be in two places at once, and dual digicell. For more information, click on the banner ad in this week's show notes page to get to the ICOM America website and its fine line of amazing amateur radios. And when you finally go to buy your next ICOM radio, be sure to tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. One of the things I learned was that the reason that you always stay for the credits is because sometimes at the end of the credits there's a clip or the best music in the entire film is played during the credits. At least in Israel, everybody, as soon as the credits start to roll, everybody's out of their seats and walking out while the people come in to clear the popcorn off the floor. And I'm still sitting there. I might be the only guy left in the theater when I find out who the bad guy really was. Well, I'll tell you, in Los Angeles, a lot more people stick around uh, because they're all in the industry. They, they want to see their friends or they want to see themselves. So, yes. Uh, and uh, one little secret of the industry, the reason the end crawl music is always so good is because usually the composer is just allowed to do whatever they want. And so they put their heart and soul into that music. It is their signature. Not always, but that is uh, very often the case. Well, I think that's great. I think that's good to know. So hopefully if the listeners go to the movies again, they'll stay if they're not used to staying and hear the best music and also see whether or not there's a small caveat at the very end. Okay, so now what are you doing now in the industry? So right now my title is CG Supervisor, Computer Graphics Supervisor. I've been doing computer graphics for 25, almost 30 years in various capacities. And that would be sitting on a box, sitting on a computer, actually animating a spaceship or building a cityscape or uh, making an airplane or a tank explode or whatever. And after a while, I learned that I'm pretty good at working with other artists and very good at keeping track of schedules and deliveries and I have a pretty good eye for knowing what needs to be fixed to make the delivery look good. So I inspire young artists. I keep them on schedule. I give them a little nudge if they're going off in a wrong direction, and I give them a whole lot of praise if they're going in the right direction. Each of these films now is like its own limited liability company. It comes together for the creation of the film. It manages the asset through its life. It distributes the money according to contract. But that people like you might find yourself in a job for a year or two and then be out on the street again. Is that what's happening, or are you working now for a company that puts its services off to each of these projects? 
Oh yeah, I'm I'm on contract now with a with a wonderful company. I'm not sure if they want to be mentioned or not, but they're they're terrific. Most of my career has been uh, short term jobs. Uh, I think my longest my longest freelance job would have been about a year, and my shortest freelance job would have been four days. You come in, you solve a problem, and then you're back out on the market. Yep. How is that? Is that stressful? It was for the first five years or so. It's a long time. Yeah, it was uh, very hard on my wife as well. Uh, however, uh, I learned, and maybe it's a little bit of overconfidence or a little bit of looking at my own work, realizing that, you know what, I have a marketable skill and I'm pretty easy to get along with, so something will pop up. And it became a matter of saving up when, you know, it's feast or famine. So when it's feast, you you save those uh, save those shekels and put them in the bank somewhere and then live off of them while you're looking for the next gig. That's very cool. And and it seems to me that you're busy and being busy is good. It seems to me there's no ending. Even with the corona, there didn't seem to be an end to the need for computer graphics types. Well, the industry absolutely shut down uh, about March 15th, 16th of 2020. Just the entire industry worldwide stopped. Now, post-production takes three to six months from when they stop filming to deliver the work. So in my case, I had work until June, and then there was nothing. There were no jobs. There was no work. Nothing was done whatsoever. And that gave me the chance to learn Morse code. So this was your introduction then to amateur radio? Oh, no, no. I got my technician in general in 2018, and I got my extra in 2019. Okay, so let's go back then. How did the amateur radio story begin then? I had been, I like to say, orbiting amateur radio for years. I knew, I didn't know any other hams, but I knew people who talked about it, and some of my author friends uh, wrote books that involved ham radio because they thought it was a neat idea that you can communicate, but there's interference and so they would make that part of the story. And of course, uh, how many episodes of Star Trek and whatnot, Morse code will come in through the radio when somebody says, oh, I remember that. Um, so I've been orbiting ham radio for a long time. And then I was at a, I was at a sci-fi convention and I was talking to somebody about all my various interests, and they said, well, you should add, add ham radio to that. And I said, now, what exactly is ham radio? He happened to be the first ham radio operator who I met, and I would love to tell you his name and call sign, but I've forgotten. Um, but he said, uh, yeah, look it up and go to these websites and listen in on, you know, uh, uh, he told me about web SDRs so I can listen into stuff and see if you like it. And so I did all of those things, and I listened, uh, and I read books. And uh, over the course of a few months in 2018, I started watching uh, uh, on YouTube. There's a guy, W4EEY, I think, and he has entire classes on YouTube, technician, general, and extra. And I just watched him, and I watched him, and I took the practice tests, and then one day I went to the uh, GLARG testing uh, right here in Van Nuys and uh, got 100% on the technician. And the VEs looked at me and said, do you want to try for the general? Yes, please. And apparently I did very well on the general. They wouldn't tell me what I got. And uh, I went off and uh, started looking for a radio. Can we go back just a second? Yes. A guy at a convention who's an amateur radio operator tells you to look it up. And he gives you some suggested sites. Do you think that's good advice for uh, somebody that has never really heard of amateur radio before? This is no criticism of him. I'm just wondering whether or not we get it wrong, who have been amateurs, like, duh, don't you know about amateur radio? Of course you should know about amateur radio. We know about amateur radio. Is there something that we could do better in terms of giving you resources short of calling you back and say, oh, no, Jeff, I met you at the sci-fi convention. I'd like to follow up with you on amateur radio. Was there something missing from that? Well, I do remember that he and I talked enough that it was obvious I knew something about it. So he didn't feel, I guess he didn't feel he needed to bring me in from the beginning. But yes, that would not have been a good introduction if I had never heard of it before. Do we get it? I, I think we get it 
right if we're talking to the right person. One of the topics I discussed at your expo was where to look for potential new hams, not how to talk to them. And if you're talking to somebody who's already into electronics, as I was a little bit, and who's already into communications, which is my whole industry, uh, and who's already been on commercial radio, and we can talk about that uh, from my very early days, then it's a very easy sale, as it were, to say, well, this is these are the pluses to ham radio. And so he sold ham radio to me a bit before he said, go look it up. Uh, the fact that I was writing everything down probably helped <laughs> that whole thing. So, so you were taking notes. It wasn't, you know, like you're standing in the street. Oh, I was absolutely. I was taking notes on the back of the uh, the handouts that they give you the the program. So that was uh, that was so. It was obvious I was interested, and I I followed his uh, his lead, and uh, I googled. I you know he didn't mention YouTube, but I found a a wealth of information on YouTube. And I knew once I found out the, that there were three tests and three levels, I looked up the classes. That's how I found it and uh, came up with a little uh, learning process for myself. And so you got your first license in 2018? Yes. Is it the call sign you have now, which is KM6TVJ? Oh, yes. And you've had no desire to look for a, a different call sign? Uh, vanity. A vanity call sign. I thought about it, but I've got Television Jeff. Why would I want to change that? I think that's actually pretty good. I'm just curious, Jeffrey, now that you're a ham in the entertainment industry, does it all of a sudden seem apparent that there's a lot of hams in the entertainment business? Are they like sticking out? Are you finding them? No, I'm not. And I talk about it uh, from time to time uh, in meetings or whatever, especially if we get close to... Uh, a subject where it might be might come up, and it's it, it's sort of a uh, sort of a, a CQ in an otherwise non ham meeting, and I'll bring up, oh yeah, well I'm a ham. Silence. All right, back to the topic at hand. <laughs> so I I am looking for them. I haven't found them. I have much more luck at well at the sci fi conventions. I I speak at Comic Con regularly and and other conventions and so i'll mention it while i'm up on stage and i'm a ham operator km6 tvj and somebody will always raise their hand and just shout out their call sign right there in the audience so that's a lot of fun now in your presentation that you made at the march qso today virtual ham expo which was last month you said that there were three areas where we might go looking for new hams you said the maker movement for example are you part of the maker movement I am. Uh, for many years, I taught 3D printing at my local makerspace. Uh, I love 3D printing. It's, it's one of my many hobbies. Uh, and I love teaching 3D printing. That was, uh, it was a great joy to me. And that all ended uh, with the lockdowns, and that particular uh, makerspace uh, disbanded. They closed. They closed down, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking around for another one, but I've always liked making things. Uh, when I can, years ago, I, uh, I got into making paper uh, by hand, and it was a lot of fun. I've uh, been making beer for quite a while, which I don't know if that's a maker movement thing, but it's a lot of fun. The, and I make things in the computer, which is a bit of a cheat, but uh, it's a career. Was the maker movement, would you include like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, those kinds of things in that maker movement too, robotics? Absolutely, one hundred percent. And robotics mostly works by remote control, which is radio, which is communication. So that's an um, an easy connection. And especially since ham radio now has gone, it, it has so much digital communication built into it. It's it's a natural segue from one to the other. And of course, uh, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis are are huge in ham radio. So that's another another thing you can do with them. I haven't gotten into Arduinos or Raspberry Pis myself, but I look forward to it. Now, you're a private pilot, and you mentioned that in your presentation. Do you think that private pilots and preppers, I think preppers was also another group, do you think that they are potential targets for us who are looking to expand the amateur radio ranks? Absolutely. And uh, actually, I had not thought of mentioning pilots in my presentation. So if I do it again, I'll bring that up. There is quite the overlap between pilots and ham radio operators. Uh, if, if I hang out with a few pilots, usually some of them are uh, are also amateur radio uh, operators 
uh, wherever you go. And for preppers, obviously, a, an important part of preparing for whatever disaster is communication. And at some point, they hit a brick wall of, well, I know how to get a radio, but I don't know how to use it, and I don't know when I can use it, and all the legalities of it. Well, that's all in the technician test. So that's uh, a very, very easy connection to make. Uh, my whole theory behind that presentation was if somebody's already interested in a topic that is adjacent to ham radio, it's an easy discussion to have. It's an easy sell to say, you should think about ham radio because it dovetails with what you're already into. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. I think there's almost 800,000 licensees in America who've gotten amateur radio licenses, but the majority of those people are not on the air. So it's kind of like they went as far as to get the license, and this could also include preppers. And maybe they bought the Baofeng radio because that's kind of where they thought they should go as a first radio, probably from poor advice. But they don't improve their skills. So it's kind of like if you're a prepper and you have a radio in the box, but you don't bring that radio out and you don't use it on a regular basis, it's kind of like at the time when you really need it, you just kind of don't know where to start. And that's exactly what I tell them. I say, when there's trouble, you won't know what to do. And in order to practice, you need a license. The other thing I always tell, I tell preppers, I tell anybody who is thinking about getting a license, go find your local club. And I've gone so far on Facebook as to actually find a local club for them if they tell me what town they're in. I love the the club that I'm in here in the San Fernando Valley is just a wonderful group of men and women. Which club is that? It's the San Fernando Amateur Radio Club. A very old club. It is a very old club. It's been around for a long time. W6SD.com. Uh, they're up there. They have one, two, three, four, four or five nets every week, uh, two meters and repeaters and 10 meters. And then we even have some informal uh, nets that came out of not being able to go to Denny's once a week uh, because of the lockdown. So we started uh, a two meter sideband chat twice a week and I attend as many of them as I have time for and and I would and I would say any the that in fact might be the missing link for anybody who gets a license and then doesn't do anything with it, because the local club is going to have activities. They're going to have nets. Heck, there might just be somebody who lives a few blocks away or a couple miles away that you can set up a sked with just to practice with your Baofeng or your your Yesu, preferably, uh, and to get better using it. I was religious about getting on the nets when I first got my radio just to practice, just to learn how people talk to each other on a net. What is the proper way of doing things? Uh, it was wonderful. And I recommend it highly. I think that we have a sense as old timers, I'm coming up on my 50 year anniversary here as being a ham radio operator. We somehow think that if we're not getting kids into amateur radio, that somehow we're failing. Are we failing? I don't think so. I was 51 when I got my license. And I absolutely love it. And the advantage of getting your license at 51 is you can afford to do more things than you can when you're 17. There's also, I, I, under, I understand the, the desire to get young people because they'll be in it longer. And also, usually when people get older, they're set in their ways and they've got their hobbies and that's that. But I'll tell you what, once you get excited about ham radio and you realize that it is a thousand hobbies in one, Suddenly, your entire retirement is all planned out. You know you're going to be playing with radios the whole time. Uh, so I don't think we need to go after kids. I think it's great when there's an 11-year-old who gets their license or a 17-year-old who gets his license. That's, 
That's wonderful. Uh, and I love reading about that uh, in the ARL magazine. However, most of the people I know got their licenses in their 30s and 40s. Maybe those are the new kids. Right, exactly. When I'm on my the nets, <laughs> I am the kid. So, yeah. Oh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, you, with, with few exceptions, I'm one of the youngest people who is active in the club. Is there something that amateur radio clubs could do better? Obviously, the San Fernando Amateur Radio Club is well known. There's a number of guests of the QSO Today podcast who were members or even 40, 50 years ago. But is there something that amateur radio clubs could do better that they're not doing towards new hams and new members? That's a great question. It's not one that I've thought about. You know, um, I think having an Elmer program where you ask your older members who wants to Elmer a new uh, a new ham. I found uh, an Elmer in the club by happenstance. He and I got along. Uh, we're both in the entertainment industry, and he's been absolutely wonderful. But there was no, hey, welcome to the program. Well, I'm sorry, welcome to the club. Here's so-and-so. If you've got any questions, email them, or they'll be on the air, and you can call them up, or you know, any any kind of way to set up an Elmer student relationship. I think that would be wonderful. Uh, and it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing to ask and it's a tough thing to make happen. I'm sure there are clubs out there that do that. That would be the number one, uh, thing I would suggest. The other one would be to have more events. I love field day and I love winter field day more because it's not as hot, but, uh, <laughs> I grew up in Southern California, winter field day. It seems to me is a beautiful spring day in the middle of December. That's about as cold as it gets here. We uh, we brave those 60-degree winters. You might need an umbrella. You might. You might. You might. Yeah, that is a definite possibility. Uh, so if they had more than just those two events, and they don't have to be huge. You don't have to take over the whole parking lot or whatever. But say, hey, uh, once a month, we're all going to get together in this park. And some people bring radios and some people bring hot dogs. And let's just have some fun. Post-COVID, I think we could start thinking about that. Maybe we all think that our club should do that, but then we forget that really our club is the six guys guys and gals that are actually running the whole thing for everyone else. I mean, what would keep you from telling the club, hey, I'm willing to take on the weekly hot dogs in the park operation. Do you think that would create an event? Yes. And once I'm not working seven days a week like I am, I would definitely do something like that. Uh, the one downside of working in entertainment is schedules are incredibly random and they change on a moment's notice because deliveries happen when they happen. So I find it hard to promise somebody a given day, a week or two or a month in advance, which is why I was glad that you were able to give me so many times that I could talk to you on this because I could plan for that. But for the, I scheduling, Anything that far out for me personally would be challenging. Uh, so I think the six or seven people who run a given club are the ones who are retired and have uh, dedicated their retirement to ham radio. I look forward to being able to do that someday. I'm throwing out a suggestion here. Again, I always apologize to the audience because I should be letting you talk. But you know what? You could automate. You don't necessarily have to be at every weekly one. But you could actually create the mailing list on Mad Mimi or something like that and actually just start pulling the levers and get that ball rolling. And other people will come mm. as long as it's, you know, somebody says, oh, this is the park. This is the time. These are the benches over here. We've already reserved the benches for this time. And you could probably automate the process. And actually, you don't even have to then show up every time as long as you know that people will show up. That's interesting, Eric. I'm, I'm going to think about that because that is interesting. I'm getting to be an old man, and so therefore automating everything seems to be the way that I'm thinking these days because there's just not enough of me to do everything, even though that's always my desire. I completely understand that. You made another presentation where you were talking about portables across America, where you actually had this idea to do a contest. How did that go? To be honest, we had some technical difficulties uh, at the presentation, so... I wasn't quite sure who was listening to it and who wasn't. I did not get a whole lot of feedback on it, and I have not heard much since then. Here's your opportunity, Jeffrey. Okay. What was your idea that you had that you wanted to present? Again, I apologize for any technical difficulties. 
As we've said, it's not necessarily a high-budget or even a low-budget film from Hollywood that we're doing on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, but it has a lot of moving parts, and some of them break. I was not complaining. I was merely making a statement. No, it's okay. I'm just explaining why it's possible that your presentation didn't go off. Fair enough. So, first of all, what was the idea that you had? The idea I had was nearly every new ham today gets, as you say, a Baofeng or, or maybe some other radio. But what they have is they've got 5 watts, they've got FM, they've got whatever antenna. They can reach, depending on their terrain, a mile, 5 miles, 10 miles. And so I started thinking about the game that we used to play as a kid around the table, Whispers, where one person would whisper to the person next to them a phrase, and then the next person would whisper the phrase and would go around the table and it would change and it would be hilarious. And I started thinking, well, that's a whole lot like interference. That's a whole lot like a dropped message or, or whatever. And so I started thinking, well, what if we played a game like that with handhelds, five watts maximum? And the idea was not to see how many people you could contact, which is what most contests are, but to see how accurately and how quickly you could get a message from the east of you, send it to the west, or the west of you, send it to the east, or north or south. And this contest, everybody in either a given uh, Maidenhead Square or across the country, if we can set it up that far, would be ready on the radios at a certain time. They'd be standing outside somewhere they're going to get a good signal. And up and down the west coast, we would have phrases, probably every grid square from the Mexican border up to the Canadian border. And then on the East Coast, from the Canadian border down to the edge of, uh, of Florida. And they would start at a given time and try to get the message to the other ocean, to, to, uh, to the other shore across America, five miles at a time, ten miles at a time. And so you'd be listening for a message, sending it on. Listening for a message, sending it on. And I realized you wouldn't know if you're sending it north, south, east, or west. But since everybody's got the same idea, send it on, send it on. My hope is that the message from the East Coast would get to the West and the West Coast would get to the East. And through some kind of automation, and this is where uh, my planning falls apart, I wasn't quite sure how to keep track of those messages. Some kind of uh, tracker, some blockchain. Sure. It's not a currency, but you could create a kind of a, a blockchain wallet that everyone would have it would update automatically as people add more stuff to it sure oh that that would work something like that and so part of it would be sending on the message and the other part would be typing into the website or into the into you know and uh, updating the blockchain with uh, hey i sent off this message at this time whatever uh however that would work and i think it would be very exciting to be a part of that the other issue i have is how long would that take at 10 seconds of transmission to go you know, at 10 miles a hop to go 3,000 miles, that's uh, quite a <laughs> quite a bit of time. Maybe you would allow for some linking or something like that, meaning that if you knew where the destination was supposed to be, somehow we'd have to get there. Sure, exactly. No, we could do that. And, and well, that brings up the question of are repeaters allowed? Because I can get on the repeater here at Oat Mountain and talk to people all over the country. Uh, so I don't know if that would be quite fair play. No, no, I, I like the idea of doing it simplex. Right, me too. Maybe a little bit farther than five miles, unless it's a whole weekend. And it could be a whole weekend. You could actually have some kind of a project where you're passing some real traffic. Something that, like you were saying, when you're playing whispers or telephone. Right, or telephone. Uh, and I know in Civil Air Patrol, they actually do this uh, as an emergency practice. They try to send messages on uh, various frequencies and the entire point of that is to make it absolutely letter accurate. People are actually graded and judged at the, the headquarters in Alabama on that. Some, something a bit more fun than that. Well, I think that's a great idea. Now, you put it out here, and I hope that people will reply to you on the show notes page on the comments section. But also, have you tried to fly that kite you know, with your radio club? I have not. That's actually a really good idea. Because they could organize at least our grid square and practice. Our grid square goes from uh, DM04, goes from Santa Barbara out to the deep desert in Palmdale. So that would be a very interesting 
mini test just to do it from one end to the other there. One end to the, of the grid store to the other. And you have, obviously, you've got the Angeles National Forest in the way. So anybody that was going to get you over the mountains is going to have to be either strategically located for that. And by the way, that seems to me that that would also give you, it's kind of like soda. It also, you know, would put people out in their cars with their portable radios in order to be able to transverse those humps. That is, in fact, one of the mountains you'd have to climb, especially out here. And my thought was in the Midwest, it, that part would be a bit easier. Yeah. So, you know, or I would just get up in my plane and be the high point for everybody. <laughs> right. Well, you could do that. If it's a weekend event, then I don't know whether they allow portable radios in airplanes anymore. I used to be able to operate two meters and 440 from a commercial jetliner, but I don't think they allow that anymore. Not on the commercial. Uh, I have to double check. I'm pretty sure it, it's perfectly legal from a, from a private airplane. Uh, especially the one I fly doesn't have very advanced electronics, so nothing's going to get affected. Well, I think that's a fine idea. Maybe it needs a, kind of a more of a local emphasis to get started. So maybe you do San Diego to San Francisco or you do something like that. Oh, okay. The nice thing about California is, is you've got 8,000-foot mountains, and that certainly helps. If you've got a 5-watt radio, you can certainly talk a few hundred miles mountain to mountain. That is true. That is true. I, I often, just hiking in the mountains near here, uh, I will speak halfway to the Mexican border, just climbing up a mountain because there's nothing between me and them but water and flat ground. So, yeah. Can we go back a little bit and talk about mentoring in amateur radio clubs? Mm -hmm. Do you get a sense? And obviously, this is not a criticism of any club, including the club that you belong to, that as a newbie, that you have a sense that it's probably not a good idea to ask for help? I've never gotten that feeling. Although I've noticed online, which I think is where most people go for questions, there are quite a few, let's just say disgruntled souls who seem to respond to innocent questions with derision. They really just come down on newbies. And if there is one problem with our hobby, it's that type of response. So my hope is that all new hams understand that it's great to ask questions. And my hope is that uh, the more seasoned hams will either help or keep quiet. Right. I think uh, there's a sense that what's obvious to us, because we've been doing it forever, and we forgot that when we were kids or when we were new hams, that, and I say this all the time, putting a PL259 on the end of RG8 is something that everybody is naturally gifted with. <laughs> I guess that's one advantage to only... Having been a ham for four years, I clearly remember not knowing anything. And how important having people lead you. There's no faster way to master amateur radio or anything else than by having a mentor. Agreed, 100%. Uh, which is why when I go onto forums or uh, a chat group or Facebook or wherever, uh, I will take some time and I will answer questions as best I can and uh, try to be as... If, if I don't know the answer, I won't. But if I do, I'll help, and then I'll try to point the who's ever asking the question somewhere else. And I think that's uh, – I think we should make that something like a uh, – not a rule, but uh, a philosophy of – what's what's the term? Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Yeah, that's right. Pay it forward. And if, if somebody's asking a stupid question to you, it's not to them. You know, Nobody's going to ask a stupid question to them. If you're sick of answering that one question, just keep scrolling and don't worry about it. Or somebody else will answer the question unless they don't answer the question. Or somebody else will answer the question. Right. Somebody and somebody else will answer the question. So I, I think we should we should make that a, uh, a a philosophy of of being a ham radio expert, as it were, or, or a seasoned ham. We will return to our guests in just a moment. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. The wind system in California, and people can look that up. I'll put the link to that in the show notes page, is a system that's connected with IRLP and All Star. And I listen to it because if you want to keep a channel busy, then the way to keep it busy is connected to the wind system because there's actually people there all the time. 
But I often hear newbies come on. What they'll do is they'll ask for signal reports. I think it's because it's a way of saying, I'd like to talk to somebody, but I don't know how to ask to have the conversation. And you don't want to say, you know, you learn very quickly that you don't say CQ on an FM repeater. What do you think that newbies could say? You know, what is the code word like? I'm new and I would really like to talk to somebody about anything. What could they do in order to be able to create that conversation? And what could us old timers do to be a little bit more sensitive to understanding that that's what's really going on? That's a great question. By the way, I love the wind system. Uh, that was the, the first, first repeater that I discovered down here. What I learned to do was I would say monitoring, which is the way to say I'm, I'm listening. And then I would say, is anybody out there? It's very friendly. Hey, anybody, anybody else out there? And more often than not, somebody would come back, oh, yeah, so-and-so San Diego, so-and-so Texas. Uh, one time somebody came back with Wales. The, the wind system is connected to England. So you never know. And as far as, uh, you know, an old person, if you want to talk, then talk. And if you don't, then don't. It's, uh, it's very simple. So uh, The wind system was connected to Israel for quite a while until I lost the radio site. So hopefully at some point it'll be connected again. Yeah, that, w- that would be great. Uh, then you and I could talk on our handhelds. <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? From our backyards or whatever. Yeah, that's, I think that is amazing that, uh, that we have the technology to do that. That is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I don't know if that is official ham radio lingo to say, is anybody out there? But it works. And I do it in a humorous, friendly tone, and people come back. And once or twice, somebody said, that's not the proper language to use. I would say, oh, what is the proper language to use? They would say whatever they think it is. I find it, I find it useful. There, and there's no reason why, you know, no, you don't say CQ on a repeater. But again, you, you, know, you don't have to, you know, there, there, there are no laws about what you, how you say hello on a repeater. They're made up along the way. They're made up along the way. And... Right. And so the the basic rule of ham radio is to communicate. I've I've had some absolutely wonderful conversations on on the wind system and on other repeaters around here just by saying monitoring anybody else out there. Have you found I mean obviously I say obviously and obviously is not obvious to probably to people that are listening to the podcast that are not in Los Angeles but every channel, every frequency, every mountain top in California has an amateur radio repeater or repeaters on it. So there's no shortage of places to have conversation. Have you found places for you where you can talk about piloting, for example, or the industry that you're in, or is there just as a place to talk about things? Do you find that that's happening more and more now? Yeah, there's a, I think it's, there's a weekly net, and I've forgotten the frequency, and it's the Flying Goats. And everybody on there, as far as I can tell, is a pilot. So it's a ham radio net, and pretty much everybody on there is also a pilot. And it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, however, again, I, I have not found very much overlap between the entertainment industry and ham radio. Maybe it's out there, and maybe people will listen to our conversation here and get back to me at work and say, I didn't know you were a ham. Or a Comic-Con, for example. You could talk about things of interest or 3D printing. It seems to me that... We have the resources and infrastructure and the international footprint, if you're using All-Star, IRLP, or DMR or something like that, to actually create, why not create nets around special interests that are even outside of amateur radio? That's actually a great idea. Most most nets center around ham radio, obviously, but to create one for 3D printing, I think, would be an absolute natural. I think so. Do you own your own 3D printers? I own two 3D printers, yes. Can I ask which ones? Sure. My most recent one is a used Lulzbot Mini, uh, which somebody was throwing away because it didn't work, and so I fixed it, and it, now it works great because Lulzbot makes great 3D printers. And I get I get nothing from them for saying that. And then the other one is a Kitty Tech Shadow 5S, which is a DLP-style uh, SLA printer. So the first one is... Uh, FDM, that's where they melt the plastic and put it out in layers, and it builds up with plastic. And the other one uses a vat of liquid resin that is solidified by UV light in a very thin shape. 
So the one printer is very reliable, very fast, and everything comes out with those horizontal lines built into the shape. The the Kitty Tech is a very small print area. I mean, it's your basically your smartphone is about the print area, um, but everything comes out absolutely smooth and gorgeous on that. And one of the companies I do consulting for, we have something similar to that that uses that vat of resin. Mm-hmm. And boy, that resin is really expensive. It's gotten cheaper. It might be more expensive on the professional grade uh, that you do. I, I find it to be very smelly and messy, but it, it it doesn't take that much resin to print something, especially when your total uh, print size is uh, you know 80 millimeters by 120 millimeters. <laughs> it's it's not you know that you, there's not much resin that you can use in a print. And that unit also has like another unit where you actually put the print right and dry it or heat it or UV it or whatever it is you're doing. Right. Well, so there's always extra resin on there. It's a very wet process. So the very first thing you want to do is put it in some uh, isopropyl alcohol and that will dissolve off the resin that has not solidified. And then you want to take that now clean print and put it under UV light for a while, which finishes the, uh, the solidifying process and gives the entire print a bit more strength. What software do you use for designing 3D parts? I use the same software I use at work. <laughs> I, use, uh, I use Lightwave and Maya uh, because that is the software that I use every day for making spaceships and models of Manhattan or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. And all of them will export, uh, will all export uh, an OBJ or a DXF, uh, which is not the preferred model format. Um, but most of them will also export an STL, which is the preferred format for, um, for all 3d printers. So that is, uh, a, a pretty good little process for me. A lot of people will use some sort of CAD software and that's fine. I never really learned any of that software. And then of course you have to use a slicing program to turn it into the code that the 3d printer actually recognizes. What's the current rig? Current rig is, uh, the two rig. Well, <laughs> when I was at my ham, uh, when I was at the makerspace, there was a guy there who needed help getting his CR10 3D printer working. An older guy, and he was one of the people that I was talking to about about ham radio. And we we're talking, we we're talking. I said, "I'm going to go in. I'm going to get my license. I'm going to go take my test." He said, "Good luck, Jeff." And I saw him a, a couple of weeks later, and we we're talking about 3D printing. He said, "So how'd that test go?" I said, "Well." I got technician in general. He said, you did? I said, yes, great. I saw him the next week, and he said, Jeff, I have a present for you. He had rebuilt an FT-2000 from a whole bunch of broken FT-2000s, and he gifted it to me. Wow. Uh, And he said, I'm not going to tell you how to work it. you got to figure all that out, but I think if you passed your tech in general, and congratulations, and the only rule is you can never sell it. You have to give it to another new ham when you feel they have, uh, they, they've earned it, you know, or they've, they've done a great job getting their license, just like you did. Uh, so that's Jay Simmons, K6RIY. We're still in contact. He's a great guy. He's uh, an engineer up on Mount Wilson, keeping TV stations working, electronics wizard. And for fun, he rebuilds uh, ham radios and other, other radios. He bu- rebuilds all kinds of electronics. So I still have the FT2000, mostly use it for Morse code. And then I have a used FT-991 uh, that I mostly use for voice and FT-8. Okay, and what's your favorite operating mode? I love talking to people, actually, <laughs> you know, hearing their voice and I hear their voice. That is my absolute first love. Uh, FT-8 is the, the mode that I love to hate because I can never quite get that last state or that last uh, uh, grid square. Uh, and it's it's a big video game, and it's I can do FT8 while I'm doing other things, which is nice. So you'll leave FT8 running in the background as you're doing something else. Yeah, and I'll I'll see if somebody's you know if I'll see if there's a CQ from some I'll I'll answer all CQs I, you know I don't mind on FT8. Um, and then um, sometimes if I actually give it my attention, I'll go hunting for that one state or that one grid square that I need. But for the most part, it's something going on in the background, and then I click connect you know i i you know double click on them and and make the connection and do you think that ft8 is a good mode for a beginner does it make you feel successful doing ft8 
Yes, uh, especially in the beginning. Uh, and then it's you know that that last that last one percent takes ninety percent of your time if you're going for worked all states or worked all counties or or one of those like that. Uh, but in the beginning, you know, it's 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 a wonderful instant gratification kind of mode. I miss the fact that I'm not having a real conversation with all of these hundreds of people. I would much rather I I would much rather maybe type a few messages to them or find a way to say, hey, let's go to actual voice on another band and, and talk about things and uh, what do you do and all that. That's my first love of ham radio is actually meeting new people and talking to them. What excites you the most about amateur radio then? Do you think that's what that is, meeting new people? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I love that. Uh, I, I'm i naturally gregarious. Uh, I love meeting new people in real life. And on ham radio, I can do it all over the country, all over the world. Once propagation comes back, uh, you know, I got my license at the bottom of the solar cycle. So I'm really enjoying watching the world open up slowly week by week. Oh, we all are. So, you must know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, especially those of you who've seen solar maximums before, uh, which I'm a bit jealous of. Well, I think I heard on it might have been on one of the other podcasts. I'm trying to think of which one where perhaps we think that the solar cycle is 11 years, but it actually might be much longer. So this seems like this has been a pretty down cycle for quite a number of years, and, and it coming back up is very exciting. Let me ask, what do you think our greatest challenge is facing amateur radio as a newcomer? I would have to go back to the very few. I, I have to assume that it's a very small percentage of hams who are rude or unhelpful to new hams. Uh, I think that is, at, in fact, the biggest challenge because people are interested. People are getting licenses all the time. Uh, we hold uh, testing every other month, and then uh, there's another testing in the next valley north of us. They hold the testing the opposite month. So once a month, we're licensing you know, 5, 10, 15 new hams, and we're just one little club in the corner of California. And then when these people go out and ask questions – if the first person they meet is a bit rude, that's not a good look for ham radio. So to me, the biggest challenge is, is that, is trying to find a way, if you are the kind of person like me who wants to help new hams, be the first person to answer so that they get, uh, they get that welcoming feel right off the bat. If a new person shows up to a net, <clears throat> um, give them an extra five or ten minutes to to make mistakes and even if it messes up your your schedule uh be welcoming so that kind of rambled on no 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 i think you're right on the truth be known is up until i started the expo i thought that hams were extraordinary and the truth is in my opinion the majority the vast majority i'm talking 10,000 versus 200 whatever that ratio is that the hams are extraordinary Amateur radio operators are extraordinary people, and we have our chaff. And it's unfortunate that I've actually met some now after all these years because I never thought that that was the case. But you know what? Ham radio operators are a cross-section of the larger population. And I think in a place where you live where you have such a high density of amateur radio operators that you're going to run into people who aren't friendly. I've never met one in person. Uh, you know, to my, to my own good luck. So, yeah, and I would agree with your ratio. I it would even put it higher. I would say 10,000 10, to 20, 10,000 to 50. But they have an outsized effect on new hams. They don't have an outsized effect on experienced hams. We, you know, let them have their say and, and move along. But if a new ham, if that's their first post or their first question at a club or, or however, or on a net, and they get one of those one in 10,000 rude people, that's probably one less ham that we're going to have moving forward. And that's unfortunate. You know, things are different on the air now. I mean, I hear language, well, I hear language on TV that I, it still makes me embarrassed. But then I also hear language on, on the air that also embarrasses me. Do you think that amateur radio operators should call out people that will diss a new ham or something like that? publicly? Should we publicly shame people that are rude or unhelpful to people on the air? I'm of two minds of that, and I don't know for sure. All, all, of, my, uh, all of my mentors, uh, all, all of my Elmers, 
told me, just spin the dial. Just move along. There's plenty of band. Go somewhere else. But in my heart of hearts, I kind of want to say something. And I kind of want to shame them a bit. So I think as I get older, I'm going to be more in the camp of saying something. And I don't think I would respond like with like. I'm not going to use that language. I'm not going to. Be, no, no, no. Uh, but I think a very simple, hey, that's not what we're about. Or, you know, what kind of rig you got? Change the change the whole topic of the change the subject. Now there are frequencies where somebody will just have the rudest recording going. And so there's not actually the, you can tell that it's, it's something on a loop and I have no idea how to solve that. I don't know if, if they have that in the rest of the world here in Southern California, you can find that frequency pretty easily. And I'll see in chats, people say, Hey, what's going on on this frequency? I was like, just spin the dial. I think you have to do that now. What advice, Jeffrey, would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? To new hams? Well, to both. Find a club. Uh, and I, I like the advice that you've been giving me in this conversation, Eric, which is go be active. Uh, you know, if, if they're not doing something you like, make a suggestion. Hey, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's go do that, uh, that weekly or monthly barbecue out in the park with radios or whatever it is. Uh, let's, let's have a build a thon at the clubhouse, whatever people are into or do it on the air or do it on the air. Right. Sure. What was interesting to me is that you did this thing on two meter single sideband. I thought that was an interesting, it's an interesting mode anyway. And it's an interesting mode in a metro area like that you're in. Sure. But it seems to me even on two meter single sideband, you could do a 3d net Maybe with a project, a weekly project. New can do it. And, of course, just because you're on the air doesn't mean that you couldn't post pictures on a common place. I mean, you have all of this facility now that isn't necessarily exclusive. <laughs> That's true. Uh, all of our nets are also on Zoom. Not everybody is on Zoom, but that is an option. So it would it could be the kind of uh, net where if it was going to be 3D printing, you could hold up your print to the camera and show people what you've done or post pictures and just upload a link and then they can look at the picture on their computer uh, as it were some of some of our nets lately have been talking about 3d printing because more and more people uh, around me are into 3d printing and some people actually do it professionally which is fun so uh, yeah for new and returning hams start a net why not uh, or uh, start yeah, start a net, and may maybe you start a net on your uh, on your local repeater, just so you can reach more people. Yeah, you know, especially if you're not in a metro area where everybody is a mile away from each other. Well, one of the things, even with a local repeater, is that you can actually start to build community. Exactly. Around an idea, I love communities around ideas. Jeffrey, it was such a pleasure. I really looked forward to having this conversation. I'm glad we had it. And I really appreciate your viewpoint and what you've brought to Amateur Radio. And I wish you nothing but great success and happiness in the hobby. And it sounds to me that you'll be one of our leaders here in not too long. Well, thank you, Eric. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak in this. It was an absolute pleasure. 73. 73, Eric. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Jeffrey. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in KM6TVJ Tango Victor Juliet in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. 
I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric, 4Z1UG, 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.